All right, excellent. Now, right, good evening. So my name is Louise Boylan. I am a teacher at the Institute of Education. I teach in the day school and I teach in the part time courses and the crash courses and things like that. I also do a lot of textbooks and the less stress, more success revision books that uh, you may have at home or if you're a parent, your children may have at home. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about the leaving certificate higher level paper. OK, and I have a PowerPoint, but once I put the PowerPoint going, I think it's going to take over my screen. Right. So I won't be able to see any questions and answers or anything that gets put in. Right. So if you have a question during my, my presentation as such, if you just want to hold on to it till the end. So when I'm finished, then I'll get rid of the PowerPoint again and then I'll be able to come in and read any questions that are there. OK. So I'm just, if you excuse me now, I'm going to set this going. I just need to share it. OK, and hopefully that is correct. And now I'm going to start the presentation. OK, if uh, if I have a problem there, won't you jump in on me and tell me <laughs> that something's not working now? All right, so as I said, I've just introduced myself. So what we're going to look at tonight is kind of four aspects, right? So we're going to have getting familiar with the exam papers. So the layout of the exam paper and your timings and things like that. Looking at how the exam paper is marked and then how you should approach studying maths, because that's a very common question I get asked. And then we'll have a little bit at the end for any questions and answers. All right, so the first thing is getting familiar with the exam paper. Right, so we've got two papers, as you should know, paper one and paper two. So they're both two and a half hours in duration. So we'll just discuss paper one for a minute now. Right. So these are the topics that come up on paper one. Now, by the way, this has been recorded and will be available tomorrow. So don't think you need to be taking anything down. Right. Just relax and, and see. Can you take it all in? You can always rewatch it tomorrow, flick through it tomorrow. So in general, there's a kind of a division of the topics between the two papers, right? So in general, on paper one, these are the topics that we see more often on paper one. So our number systems and our algebra, indices and logs, functions, differential calculus, integration, complex numbers, proof by induction and sequences and series. They're often kind of jumbled up within questions, right? So it's very common to have functions and differential calculus and even logs and indices all within one question. Right, so just be careful of that. Just watch out for that. So we'll often get topics muddled up within questions. Then if we look at paper two, right? So for paper two, same duration, two and a half hours. It looks like there's less, right? There's fewer topics, but they're, they're substantial topics. So we've got coordinate geometry of the line and the circle. Then we have trigonometry, which is a massive topic in itself. Then our geometry, and then probability statistics. And the last one here is area and volume. And area and volume is a bit of a floater, right? Area and volume can go between the two papers. So it's common to see questions on paper one that might involve, say, volume and then maximizing volume if they bring in a bit of calculus to go with it, or questions on paper two in trigonometry to say working out volumes over there. The other one that often crops up on paper one is trigonometric functions because they can come under the heading of functions, right? So trigonometric functions are often on paper one, kind of more often on paper one, I think, than they have been on paper two. So just be very, very careful of that. It's important that you have a good idea of what topics are where because the two papers fall across a weekend, right? Paper one is on a Friday, paper two is on the Monday. So just you need to keep it clear of roughly what topics are on on each, but you do need to kind of be prepared for any topic coming up anywhere. Right. They have had some probability on paper one. They have had some calculus on paper two. Right. So this is like a rough agreement of what goes where, but it can vary. So just be prepared for that. Now. For the exam this June, right, this is the layout. So the exam is in two parts, section A, section B. So section A is our concepts and skills. So that's 150 marks, right? That's half of the exam paper. And section B is what we call the context and applications. These are the real life questions, right? The real world -y questions where the maths comes in to real world examples. So just jumping back to section A for a second. So this is concepts and skills. This is what we call six short questions, right? They're not very short, they're not terribly short. Each one will take up to 15 minutes, right? 12 to 15 minutes to do. There are six on the exam and you have to answer five of the six. 
OK, so six questions. You have to have, can you ditch one of them? You can leave one of them out. You're going to flick through it and you're going to very quickly know which one that you don't want to do. Right. You look at one and you'll go, nope, I'm not. I don't think I like the look of that one. Right. Hopefully there's only one that you decide against and then do the other five and do your best. Right. And we'll talk about marking schemes as we move through the slides. Those ones tend to not be in a real world application. They tend to be here's a triangle, find the missing side, right? Or here's a function, differentiate it, or find the maximum value, find the minimum value. When we go into part B, which is our context and applications, that's where we get real world questions coming in, right? So it might be a big long story about maybe a factory and a factory is designing a new cup. And this is the designs for the cup and which one should they go with to get the maximum volume, but using the minimum amount of material. And the question can go on, go on, go on for several pages. Right out of that, there are four questions and you have to answer three. So again, there's one of those that you're going to leave out. It's exactly 50 50, right? Section A is half of the marks and section B is half of the marks as well. You need to watch your time. So important to watch your time, right? And you'll know when you're doing a question at home, you really have your teeth into it and you're like, no, I'm almost there and I can get on. Oh, I made a mistake and we want to go back. And it's really hard to kind of let it go, particularly if you think you're actually making good headway with it. But it is really important that you watch your time, right? And this is important when we come to talking about the marking scheme as well, because most of the marks tend to be at the starts of the questions for the earlier parts of the questions. Because as you progress through the question, the question gets harder and harder and harder and harder, or the parts get a little bit more tricky. So they tend to what we call front load the marks. The marks tend to be near the start of the question. So if you're killing yourself towards the end of a question, you're just robbing time from a later question, right? So that's really important. So in terms of watching your time, what should your guideline for time be? Let's have a look. So that little guy was all was all stressed out, wasn't he? The next little guy is totally chill, right? Because he's figured it out. So the time per question is half of the marks, half of the marks for the question. So it's a it's a 300 mark exam and you have 150 minutes to complete it in. Right, so that's a good rule of thumb. Time per question equals half the marks. So that would mean that a section A question, a 30 marker, should be no more than 15 minutes, right? You're out of there after 15 minutes and a section B question should be no more than 25 minutes. But, but that leaves you with no time to spare, right? It doesn't leave you any time to look back over, to go to the bathroom, to drink your water. It leaves you no spare time. So try to come in under that time, right? So what I have here is this leaves you absolutely no time to spare. So aim for 12 minutes for section A and 20 minutes for the section B questions. If you stick to that, you've half an hour left over, right? So then you can go back and you can try and finish the bits that you've been stressing out about. Try to stick to those times, even when you're just revising, even when you're doing your study, right? So if you if your teacher gives you an exam question to have a crack at, 12 minutes if it's a section A question, right? 30 marks, 12 minutes. Try to get out of there in 12 minutes. Absolutely no more than 15 minutes. If you if you spend longer than 15 minutes, you're robbing time from another question where you could be picking up more marks. OK, I'm going to keep going. Now, talking about how the exam is marked, right? This is really, really important that you have a kind of an inside idea of how the exam is marked. When you're doing exam questions, if your teacher gives you exam questions due for homework or something, engage with the marking scheme. The marking schemes are all up online, right? So go in and look at the marking scheme and see how you would have done, right? It's a really important skill. Mark your own work and see where you would have got the marks. Because once you understand where the marks fall, that's how you can gain the most marks in the exam. So the first thing is, our marks, we've got, do you see the little girl on the ladder, right? That's how it is. It's a laddered approach. Our marks are in rungs going up. So say it's a 10 mark question. The options will be you get zero, you get three, you get five, you get eight, or maybe you get 10. Right? That would be if there's lots of bits along the way. It could be just zero, five, 10. It could be zero, four, seven, 10, right? There's all these different categories as we go along. So there's partial credit given for making any significant correct step along the way. And the more steps you take, then the more marks you will earn. 
right? So if you make a good attempt or a good start to start in the right direction, that'll get you onto the low partial credit. Then the middle partial credit gets you to the next, then the high partial credit, and then hopefully to full marks. OK, well, I'll show you more in a second. Usually there are very few marks going for getting the final answer, right? That might sound funny, but I constantly say to my students, this is not what you know, this is what you show, right? That's what your maths exam is. You need to go in and you need to show them every single line as you go along, right? And you can get all the way down to the end and get the wrong answer and still get, say, eight out of ten. Because if you've shown all your method and you've shown that you've done your method correctly, then you will get the majority of the marks, right? So don't worry if you're not getting out the final answer. You've probably earned a good chunk of the marks as you're going along, right? So the marks are earned for showing your progress and your workings along the way, right? It's not what you know, it's what you show. If you make a mistake, right, this is really important. Now, listen to me carefully, right? So if you're doing a question and say in part A, it says find the value for X and then part B, you have to take that value for X and you have to do something else with it in part B. If you get the wrong value for X in part A, so you make a mistake and X should come out as five, but you made a mistake and you got 15, right? You're not going to know in the exam that you got the wrong answer necessarily. You carry that 15 forward in good faith into the next section, thinking that that's the right answer and you do everything correctly from there on. You get full marks for the next section. Okay, it's only fair, isn't it? Because you don't know you have the wrong answer. You have the wrong value. So you'll get full marks as provided you're able to actually work your way through it. Right. That's the only problem, because if you have the wrong answer, maybe you'll end up with an equation you can't solve or something. If you're in a situation and part A is find X and you really haven't a clue, right? You haven't got a clue what to do, but you look at part B and you know what to do part B and you think, gosh, if only I could get a value for X, I'd be able to do part B. What you need to do is just write a little note to the examiner and the examiner is just a human being, right? It's a teacher just like me and just write a note and say, can't do part A. I'm going to say X is two and then go from there. Now you won't get, you're unlikely to get the full marks for the next section, but you'll get the majority, you get like eight out of 10 or something, right? Because you're acknowledging that you know it's not the right number, but you're going to do your best anyway, right? And maybe some years they'll give 10 out of 10. The marking scheme is a little bit fluid. I will talk about that in a minute. So just be very aware of that. So don't think that just because you couldn't do part A, that's it gone for the whole question. Absolutely not, right? If you can't do part A, just, Make up a number and continue on. If you know what to do for part B, then continue on and pick up as many marks as you can. If you leave blanks, guys, nobody can do anything for you, right? There's no marks for blanks. That's my other mantra, right? There's no marks for blanks. So make sure that you do your best, fill in every single box on the page, do something, write something, write down a relevant formula, put numbers into the formula. Now you'll be on the ladder, right? Draw a diagram, engage with the information. If it's something about, there was one year where it was something like a, a bag of marbles in a bag, in, sorry, coloured marbles in a bag, and the question went on and on and on. And if you drew a picture of the bag with the marbles, you got low partial credit because it showed that you read the question, you understood and you engaged with the question. Right, so do something, don't leave any blanks, no matter what you do. Now, oh, there we go, <laughs> right? So there's no marks for blanks, right? So try something, draw a diagram to represent the information, as I just said, write down a formula, pick a formula from the tables. You have to do something, right? So if you take away nothing else from tonight, take that away, that there are no marks for blanks. You have to do something, try something. And you'll see when you look at the marking schemes, the marking schemes are often very, very generous. OK, so we're going to look a little bit more into the marking scheme now. So sample marking scheme, right? So it's done in these kind of scales. So say it's a five mark question. It can be broken down as zero or five. That's what we call a hit or miss. It's either right or it's wrong, right? There's no attempt marks there. That would be something like a true or false question, right? There's only one possible correct answer or 035 or maybe 0245 or sometimes 02345 or sometimes 0235, right? I have at the top there, these scales can vary from year to year. So if you look back through marking schemes, what was a kind of a 10C one year might be 05 
sorry, <laughs> 0, 4, 5, 10. Another year might be 0, 4, 7, 10. Right. So these scales vary year on year. But the rough idea of it is the same every year, right, is that you've got these categories, zero for nothing of any worth, then the low one is the low partial credit, then you've got your high partial credit or mid partial credit perhaps, and then you've got your full marks at the end. OK. Now, I'm just going to have a look. I'm not actually going to do this out with you, but I just want you to have a look at this question because I want you to look at how it was marked. Right, so I'm going to be quiet for a second. You may recognise this question if you've worked through your trigonometry. I'm going to be quiet for a second. Just give you a minute to read that, OK? Now, so this was the first part of a very long uh, three dimensional trigonometric question, right? And the thing about it is, is the first part here show that AC is 1.95. They're giving you that for a reason, because if they just said find AC and you couldn't find AC, you got you fell at the first hurdle here. You were kind of snookered for the rest of the question, right? You could make up a number and you could continue on, but it's going to get messy as time goes on if you just pluck a number out of the air, right? It'll work. You'll get some of the marks, but ideally don't. So what they've started doing, and particularly more in the recent years, is they're giving you what the answer is. So they're saying show that AC is 1.95. They're giving you that so that if you get stuck on part A here, but continue on, you will still be able to take the value and continue on. Right. So that's important for a start. So if they tell you AC is 1.95, then when you go into the next part, you let AC be 1.95. Right. They're giving you that so that you can progress with the question. The second thing is. If they say to you, show that AC is 1.95, for this part here, you have to pretend you don't know that AC is 1.95, right? Don't start putting that in and showing that the left side equals the right side, right? You may not get all the marks for doing that. So you need to pretend that you don't know that AC is 1.95. Go about trying to find it, and then you get to your final answer, go, oh, hey, look, AC was 1.95, look at that. Right. So if they ask you to show that like X is two, pretend you don't know that X is two, work out what X is and bang, your final answer should be X is two. So they're telling you the answer so that A, you know you're correct and B, so that you can carry on the number to the next part if you couldn't work it out in the first part. Let's look at how this was marked, right? So this was 10 marks. Hopefully what you saw you had to do there was Pythagoras' theorem. You had two options. You could either find the entire diagonal, so from C all the way to E, doing Pythagoras, and then half it, or half the dimensions first, and then do Pythagoras. So look at the way it was marked, right? So the options here were either 0, 3, 7, or 10. So 3 was for the low partial credit. So that was if you got Pythagoras with relevant substitution. So you knew you had to do Pythagoras and you subbed in some number correctly. That got you three out of 10 marks. If you found the entire diagonal, that got you seven out of 10 marks. So if you got eight, uh, sorry, E to C. Now, interestingly, if you got that and then you showed that AC was half of that, but you didn't just like finish it, right? You didn't go to the calculator and actually divide it by two, then you still set on eight out of 10. OK, so watch out for that. So sometimes it can be tricky to get to the very top marks to get to the 10 out of 10. It can often be not, I won't say easy enough, but manageable to get to the low partial credit. But to get to the very, very top marks, you have to be bang on the money, right? You have to have it perfect, right? So watch out for that. We're going to have a look at another one now. Right, I'll be quiet for a sec. Let's have a read of that one. Now, there's a lot going on there, right? There's a lot of reading on your maths exam. So just be aware of that, right? There is a lot of reading. 
Why I've picked this one is because I think at first glance that's a bit scary looking, right? It's a bit off putting looking, isn't it? And you'll often see questions that look like this, particularly in the functions section. And what's really important is that, first of all, you don't panic, right? Don't panic in your maths anyway. It's not going to help you. Try to just be calm. We don't want any panic in the maths exam. But the second thing is, is that when you um, look at it, you need to just stop and look and say, OK, I've got an equation there. And I've got two letters. One is R and one is T. What do they stand for? Right. Well, they're telling us that R is revenue and they're telling us that T, what is it? T is the number of weeks, right? So R is revenue and T is time. So just stop and don't worry about what the context is, right? It might be something that makes no sense to you. There's been ones about water heating up over time. There's been ones about somebody learning how to type and it's the number of words per minute that they're learning Per, per day, right? And so those are the variables in that case. It might be something completely abstract that you've never seen before. And what you need to do is just look at the information you have. What do the letters stand for? What do I have and what do I want? Right, that's it. Don't panic. It doesn't look pretty, but that's OK. It's not a beauty contest, right? It's a maths test. So just look at what it is. So this question says, find the approximate revenue. So we're looking for or so I would immediately write down there or equals question mark. Produced 20 weeks after the beginning, so T equals 20. And that's it, right? So you're going to put in 20 for T, go to your calculator, get the right answer. Just be aware there in that case it's in radians, so you just make sure your calculator is in radians. Now look at the marks for that. That was 10 marks going for that, right? And it was literally. If you wrote down that T equals 20. If you just wrote that down, you got four out of 10. That's 40% guys, just for writing that down. So this is what I'm trying to say to you. Engage with the question, read it. What did the letter stand for? What do I have? What do I want? Better again, sub a number in. Look at that, high partial credit, seven out of 10. If you just put the 20 into that formula instead of the T. Right, seven out of 10, that's what, that's a H3. That's 70% on that part of that question. So even if it looks really off-putting to you, don't panic. Cam, what do I have? What do I want? Can I sub something in here? And then better again, if you actually work it out, you got your full marks, right? See your full marks minus one. I've put this one in here for a, a specific reason because I mentioned there it was radians. If you don't have your calculator and radians, you'll get the wrong answer and they will take a mark off you for doing that. Now, they'll only take one mark off you, but just be like really aware as <coughs> excuse me, as you move through your maths exam. Are, is the question to do with degrees? Is the question to do with radians? Right. And I always say to mine, you have to keep looking at the top of the calculator. Are you D or are you or? And you're going to have to flip multiple times, perhaps during the one exam. Right. You might do degrees and then the next question is radians. Then you're back to degrees again. So just keep that at the back of your head all the time. Right. If it's anything to do with trigonometry or, or angles, are you in degrees or are you in radians? Because if you get it wrong, you're going to lose a mark. The second thing is if you don't put your answer in the correct form, that's an automatic minus one. It won't be written at every single marking scheme part. It's a, like a blanket instruction that the examiners are given across the whole marking scheme. So what I mean by the correct form is if the question says that this one says, give your answer correct to the nearest euro. So if you didn't round up to the 59 there, to the 20,659, that's an automatic minus one. OK, if you leave off the units, that's an automatic minus one. And the units, remember, could even be the little degree symbol sometimes. It's not always just centimetres or centimetres squared, right? So watch out for that. So you have to give your answer in the perfect way. What, what way do they want it? Do they want it rounded? Do they not want it rounded? And is there a unit attached to this, right? Watch out for that because you don't want to be dropping those little marks at the end. They're the difference between the H1s and the H2s, I promise you. Right. And you don't want to be looking back in August and going, oh, I can't believe I left centimetres off there. That was one mark I've lost. OK, so make sure that you spend some time now, particularly as you're going towards the, the last few months here in your preparation, getting familiar with the marking scheme so that when you're sitting in the exam in June, you're saying to yourself, OK, well, I know if I don't even start this part, I'm on zero, so I need to do something. I need to write down what do I have? What do I want? Put a number in here, draw a picture. 
do something, try something, right? And sometimes that can be very, very valuable to do. Right, part three. So we've talked about what the exam layout is, how to manage your time during the exam, and how to be clever in when you're answering the exam, right? Really, really clever. No blanks. Do not leave blanks at all. You have to come out having tried every single thing on that paper within, you know, except for the questions you're not going to do, obviously. So now, how do you study maths? Right. I get this question all the time. How do I study maths? And the answer is you don't study maths, you practice maths. Right. That's the really important thing. Some of it you're going to have to learn. So let's look at this first. Right. So the material that you have to learn off, there is an element of learning. Not much, though. These are your proofs, right, or derivations. So on paper one, these are the proofs that you have to be able to do. So you have to prove root two is rational. You have to be able to construct root two and root three, derive the Morphin theorem, derive the amortization formula, derive the sum to infinity. Some of this may not make sense to you yet, but that's OK, right? You're going to get there. If you haven't done complex numbers yet, you won't know what the Morphin's theorem is. If you haven't done financial maths yet, you won't know what the amortization formula is, but you will by the end of May, I promise you. Differentiation from first principles, you've probably all done that at this stage. Proof by induction, you may not have met yet either, right? So that's stuff that you have to, you just have to sit down and learn it, right? Some of them are formal proofs that you learn off. Some of them are methods. They're step-by-step -step methods like the differentiation of first principles and the proof by induction. You, you might give it a question and you'll never see that question again, but it's just you have certain steps to follow in solving those questions and that's the bit you have to learn off. What are my five steps in solving a problem like this? On paper two, we have our constructions, 22 constructions. That sounds like a lot, but 15 of them you did in junior cert. One of them is draw a straight line with a ruler. One of them is draw an angle with a protractor, right? So some of them are very, very short. Others then are a bit longer and they're a combination of some of the earlier ones as well, right? So make sure you know how to do those. There's YouTube videos of them all online. If you're not sure, you'll find them no problem. Then you've got your geometry theorems. There are only three, but there are three biggies, right? 11, 12 and 13. There's no way around it. You just have to sit down and learn those off. Get a blank piece of paper. See, can you write them out? If you get stuck, go back. Look, where did you get stuck? What does that mean again? Oh, yeah, right. Blank piece of paper. Try it again. Try it again. Try it again. And you're going to keep doing that until you get to the point where you don't have to look back anymore. Same for your trigonometric identities. There are eight of them, numbers one to seven and then number eight, right? Check your textbooks. They're all in your textbook or in the syllabus. There's some geometry definitions. You don't learn them in the same way as you would learn definitions, say, in biology, where it has to be word for word, or I do physics as well, that it has to be word for word. This is more, uh, can you explain your own word? So what do we mean by proof? What does What is the theorem? What do we mean by theorem? What do we mean by an axiom? Right, so look them up. They will be in your textbooks under kind of a glossary or a list of definitions, but you don't have to have them word perfect. If you can explain them in your own words, all the better. And the same for the statistical terms, right? To make sure you know what is the mean, what is the median, what is the mode, what does standard deviation mean, right? You have to know what all those different words mean. You could be asked to explain them in an exam, okay? Now, the next part here then is practice, practice, practice. So once we've talked about the bits that you're going to learn off by heart, which is actually only a very, very small part of the course, the rest of the course is understanding and practice. There are other subjects where you might go back and you might look at the and same exam questions and you'll see the same exam questions coming up over and over and over again. Your maths is not so much like that. It used to be. If you guys were 20 years older, right, it, it used to be like that, but absolutely not anymore. You may have been aware of last year when the paper one happened and there was a lot of consternation around the country about the paper one because students thought it was really hard. Joe Dolan's phone line was uh, not Joe Dolan, Joe, uh, Joe Duffy, uh, his phone line was on fire about it, right? The fact of it was, was that there was questions on it that had never been asked before. Right. And that's a problem if you rely on the exam papers to do your study. So listen to this very carefully. Right. You need to concentrate on your material, right, your textbook, your notes, whatever teachers giving you, whatever practice questions you're doing in class. 
doing the exam questions is well and good to reinforce all of that. But there's exam questions that have come up in the last 10 years that are never going to be asked again or not in the same way. So it's not like other subjects, like say when I'm doing physics, we might do an experiment question and we can go back and look at that experiment question where it's been asked over the last 15 years. And you'll see the same kind of questions being asked, right? What was the diagram? Draw the graph. How do you do your calculations? Your maths is not like that. And that's a little bit daunting. I fully understand that, right? But it means that you need to spend the time on working on the material. Don't focus too much on the exam questions. They're good to practice. So if you finished going through a topic and you finished revising, say, integration, then go and try some of the exam paper questions. But don't focus too much on them. Make sure that you're also trying the questions in your textbook and trying questions from different sources, even if you have a second textbook knocking around, right? Or maybe a friend in a different school has another textbook and you could swap for a weekend or something, right? Try that and try different questions from different sources. Don't rely solely on the exam papers, OK? Now, like any like learning any skill, maths requires a lot of practice. I relate it to playing the piano, to learning to play the piano. You don't just sit down and kind of trudge your way through a song and go, OK, grand. Phew, no, that's it. I've played Jingle Bells. I got to the end. I got the right answer on to the next thing. You have to come back and you have to try it again and try it again. The same stuff over and over and over. Try it again, try it again, try it again. Right. It's OK if you try the same questions over and over and over and over. It doesn't matter if you know the answer is going to be two. X is two, right? It's not a murder mystery. It doesn't matter. Can you get from the, here from the start to the end and get the correct answer without having to refer back to your notes? Do you understand the steps that you're doing to get from the start to the finish? OK, so what I would suggest you do is pick a topic to revise. Go back over the main skills and the main concepts, right? Try a couple of questions from each section within your textbook. Find some good examples. Now, this is important. If you sit down to do um, to try a question, make sure that you have a solution or an answer somewhere, right? Or somebody who can help you because there's nothing more frustrating than starting a question, getting stuck and then having nowhere to go. Right. So make sure that you can either have a solution handy or you have a friend who's already done the question or you can go in and ask teacher how to finish out the question. Right. Don't just pick a random question off the Internet and hope for the best. I've had students do that and it's fine. We'll do it out the solution for them, but they get stuck and then they get frustrated. Right. So if you are going to pick random questions in places, try to pick ones that have the solution with them. Don't do it by looking at the solution. Right. That's like doing a crossword and looking at the answers and going, oh, yeah, I would have figured out all those words. Right. Put the solution away. Try the question. If you get stuck, then look. But don't look at the whole solution. Just look, nudge yourself on and see, can you keep going? Right. It's all about practice and it's all about kind of thinking on your feet. Right. So do find some comprehensive examples that have the solutions and then see, can you find similar questions? But again, that have the solutions. Primarily so that you can just be working away on your own, right? So if you get stuck, you don't have to rely on anyone else. That's why I'm saying that, really. You don't have to wait till Monday till you ask your teacher or whatever. Once you feel you've a good handle on that topic, move on to a new one, right? So you're going to spend you're going to spend some time this weekend doing some integration, right? Once you feel comfortable with your integration, put it to the side, pick a new topic, right? But don't put it away entirely. Don't go. That's it now. That's integration done until uh, June, right? Come back to it, but just come back to it in little bits. Come back to it, pick a random question, give yourself 20 minutes and say, right, can I do this? Can I remember how to do this? Just to keep it fresh, keep it in the forefront of your mind, right? So you're not going to sit and do it and park it for three months and then panic when it gets in within the week before the exam. OK, so you need to have a plan. It's very important that you have a kind of a plan what you're going to do each week, which topics you're going to pull back and go back over and go back over and go back over. OK. Very important, do not get overwhelmed, right? This is a big problem. It's a big, big thing we see with the leave and cert in general. Anyway, students getting overwhelmed. It's a big problem I see with maths. The maths course is huge, right? I, it's by far the biggest course on your in the whole of the leave insert, I'm sure of it. Right, leave insert higher level maths. I'm talking about, and it's very easy for students to get panicky, 
right? So you need to just chop it up into little bite-sized pieces, right? You don't need to learn the entire course this weekend. Cut it down. Say, okay, this weekend I'm going to concentrate on trigonometry. Trigonometry is huge, right? I'm not going to do all trigonometry. That's madness. I'm going to spend time on the trigonometric graphs, right? Little and often is the key with your maths, little and often. Don't look at the whole thing and, and freak out, right? Don't look at a chapter in a book and the chapter is 70 pages and go, oh my goodness, how am I going to get through that? Just pick little bits, little and often, little and often, right? Break down the topic into smaller sections. Revise each section slowly but surely. Start with the basics and build your way up. Approximately 30 minutes a day if you can. I know that's not always possible if you have GAA training or something else going on or you're in the drama society or you choir or you've got, you know, six other subjects and you've got orals coming up. I fully get it. Right. But if you can do 30 minutes, 20 minutes a day, that would be ideal or maybe 45 minutes, three times a week. Right. Try to work it into your schedule. But little and often is the key. That will be more effective than sitting down on a Sunday and going, right, I'm going to do five hours of maths. That's not going to be as effective. That's like watching what you call it's like binge watching a Netflix show. You're going to come back two months later and go, did I watch that one? I don't remember. Maybe I did watch that one. And you've watched the whole thing. I've done that. Did we watch that one? Yeah, maybe we did. Right. You're going to do it all and then you're going to forget about it. So little and often, little and often, little and often. Try to keep that in mind. Little and often. Take your time. Slow down. Slow and steady wins the race is what I have here, right? Slow and steady wins the race. I say that a lot in my classes, right? Slow, 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 slow. Little and often slow and steady. If you have a study partner, that can be good, right? Going back to what I was saying about getting familiar with the marking schemes. If you have a friend and you're kind of the same ability, if you do the same exam question and swap them, and you correct theirs and they correct yours, right? Now, it has to be a, a friend that you trust is not going to make a mock of you, right? And go, oh, I can't believe you got that wrong, Egypt, right? You don't want one of those people with you. You want somebody who's going to be helpful and encouraging, but I'm sure you've all got friends like that. And if you correct each other's work, that's actually a really useful technique for studying. Another one is if you have a friend who's struggling with something and you explain something to them. Right. There's no way to know if you understand something better than explaining it to somebody else because they'll ask questions. But why? But why? But why? And then you have to explain why, 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 why? And that solidifies it for you because that means you fully understand it. Right. And that's a big part of your maths is to make sure that you understand. It's not all learning. A little bit of learning. We talked about the learning aspect. The majority of it is pure understanding. And if you can understand it, then there's less learning to do. OK, right. Any questions? So time for questions. So what I'm going to do, because I can't see, well, maybe I can see Teams if I, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not used to using PowerPoint. Let me see what happens. Oh, I can. I can. I can see it here. OK, so what I will do is I will open up the Q&A screen. So there's a Q&A screen here. And it says no questions yet. Right. Great stuff. So hopefully you were listening to me. So if you have any questions, throw them in there. Don't be shy. You might have a question that somebody else is thinking of and they are being shy. So if you have any questions, pop them in there. And I'll answer them. Can you see where it is? The Q&A at the top of the screen, or maybe you don't have any questions. Now, right, Emily, that's a great question. Would you recommend answering all the questions and being marked on your best one? What I would do is I would go in and I would look and automatically, as I say, you're going to find one that you're not going to like the look of, right? So there's going to be one that you like less than all the rest. I would park that one, put your time and energy into the other five, say we're on section A, the other five, do the requirement. And then if you happen to have time at the end, come back. What I wouldn't do is put myself under time pressure to answer every single question. Right. I don't think that's a good use of your time. What can happen with people is they look at a question, they go, oh, yeah, this will be fine. And they start on that question and then halfway through they go, oh, no, that question wasn't fine. And then you may have to ditch out and do a different one. Right. But in general, I wouldn't do them all unless you're swimming with time at the end. But that would be rare enough now that you'd be swimming with time. 
OK, so just try to focus on the ones that you'll be happy with. Tips for the mocks next week. Just do your best. Go in. If you mean tips for us in what's coming up, I haven't a Scooby do what's coming up in your mocks. Right. Um, but just go in and do your best. Absolutely. And do as much as you make sure you leave no blanks. Same as before. I think I lost you there for a second, guys. OK, I'm back there now. Right, I see I've got questions. Um, there's questions in the chat as well. I'll look at that in a second, right? So for the Q&A, there are tips for your mocks. I don't have any tips for your mocks, to be honest, right? Um, just do everything I said there. Do your best. Right, let me see. Next one. How to choose exam questions if you haven't completed a topic. For example, I haven't learned statistics two, but I've done statistics one. I think you'll know when you look at a question if there's stuff in there that you haven't done that you'll go, oh, OK, that makes no sense to me. Right. If it mentions things like a statistics two would be hypothesis testing, inferential statistics. So if there's language there or questions that you don't recognize, you'll know. OK, no, I'm not going to do those. Right. So um, just watch out for that. How would you do a sum with thirds? Well, that's that's very specific. Go look up your textbook. Thirds will be near the start. They'll be in number systems in whatever textbook you're using. OK, or you can you can add them with the calculator. If you get 20 percent overall in the mocks, is it possible to get a H1 in the actual exam? Well, I think you'd have to ask yourself why you got 20 percent in the mocks, right? Was it a case that you didn't do the work? There's a massive difference between 20% and a H1. I can tell you now, it's not easy to get a H1 in the exam. You would want to be getting a H3 minimum, I would think, the whole way through fifth and sixth year in order to get a H1 on the day, right? It's not easy to get a H1 at all. So I would say, it, I mean, anything is possible, right? But highly unlikely is what I would think. So if you get 20% overall in your mocks, I'd be focusing on getting 40% in the real deal, to be honest, not getting up to a H1. You paper two on Thursday for the mocks. What would you recommend covering from now to then? OK, well, it depends if you've got all the topics covered. You may not have everything done at this stage. You may not have all statistics done. Trigonometry is a very important one for paper two and your line and your circle, which I'm guessing you have done at this stage. Probability is also a big one, right? So I would focus on on what you've covered, and and go with that, right? There's no this, your maths exam is not like other subjects where you can pick and choose. The questions are all muddled up. You can't leave out topics, right? And I know I know you probably want me to say yeah, leave out certain things. You just can't leave out topics. Okay, it's really important that you try and and study everything and then just hope that the questions are to your liking. Is it easier to pass in higher level or get an O1? Callum, it, de it entirely depends on who you are, right? That's, I can't answer that question, right? The best student I ever had only spent like a few minutes a night working on their maths because they went on to do a PhD in maths, right? So they're going to automatically get a H1. And then I've had students who've spent hours and hours and hours studying every night and they couldn't ever pass a higher level test, right? It just depends on you and you will know yourself, okay? So it, it depends if you're cracking away at the higher level and you're giving it your all and you're not achieving a 40%, then I think you need to maybe stop and think. Right. But also you need to be clever in how you answer the exams. Right. Keep that in mind. If you pick if you get a test back from your teacher and half of it is blank, then there's nothing the teacher can do. Right. They can't give you marks if you've left it blank. It's like going in and being asked to write an English essay and writing nothing down and then being surprised that you didn't get any marks for that section. Right. You have to do something. You have to attempt every single question. Uh, what's the most realistic grade jump from start of sixth year to the real thing? That's a very similar question to what I'm answering, right? You will get out of your maths for the most part what you put in. 
but a lot of it is also to do with natural ability as well, right? There are some people, as I say, who are just naturally very, very good at maths. They get it, they can see it, right? And other people really, really struggle. So again, it's entirely up to you. It's not a case of if you do an hour a night, then that's going to translate too, right? It's not an investment. You're not putting money in the bank and you're going to get a guaranteed output at the end, right? If you're working, and you can start to see progress and it's starting to come together and you can start to look at an exam question and not panic, then I think uh, you can kind of have an idea for yourself what's realistic. OK. Is it true the maths mock is harder than the actual leave insert maths paper? No, that is not necessarily true. Right, but what you have to think about is there's a couple of aspects here to take in mind, right? If you're sitting down to do your mock, which you are this week, that's what March, April, May, June, that's four full months nearly before your real exam. OK, so you probably don't have the course finished and you haven't had a lot of time of kind of sitting down and looking at the course on a whole. Right. So that's one thing to take into account. Right. That's like you're preparing for a marathon in June. Are you ready to do the marathon four months earlier? No, because you're not fully prepared yet, right? You can do a trial run, but you can't expect the same output. That's the first thing. The second thing is your mocks are written, either maybe your teachers wrote them or maybe they're written by outside companies and the marking scheme is set. In your leaving cert, the marking scheme is not set. Now, what I mean by that is if they write a question, and say they think oh, that's a lovely question. We're going to have it's a 30 mark question. Part A will be worth 10, part B will be worth 10 and part C will be worth 10. And then what happens is in June, all the correctors start marking and suddenly they realize, gosh, actually nobody could do that part C. That was really, really hard. So then what they do is they stop and they say, OK, well, now what we'll do is we will make part A worth 15 and just make part C worth five. And they will do that multiple times over the course of the, the month or so that the exams are being corrected. They will tweak, 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 tweak the marking scheme as time goes on. And you'll know that if you look at some of the, um, the marking scheme questions where the part A might be really, really easy and you go, that was worth 15. Wow. But that just means that there's something rotten coming further down, right, that nobody could do. And if they leave it as 10, 10, 10, then everybody will, will come out really poorly, right? Or the failure rate will be too high. The H1 rate will be too low. So the real exam gets tweaked. The marking scheme gets tweaked. Your mock exams won't get tweaked. OK, so there's two things to bear in mind there at the mock. The actual mock papers are no harder than the real exam. It's just that you're less prepared and there's no opportunity for adjusting the marking scheme as time goes on. OK, it's not that they're particularly harder. Um, let me see what revision uh, is it possible to attempt it? Let me see. Oh, my goodness, there's loads here. Hang on. Where was I? Right, the mock. OK, do you have any recommendations of resources to learn study trigonometry? I mean, you've, you should have textbooks if you there's no harm to go and buy a second textbook. Right. If you look around, you'll pick them up pretty cheap. If you pick up a second hand textbook, you might pick them up on Amazon or adverts or something like that. All the questions you can get your hands on. That's that's the ideal. Right. Get your hands on as many questions as you can. Is it possible to attempt a question and still get zero marks? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. If you go a total wrong way about doing a question, then yes, absolutely. You can get zero marks. Right. But if you if you make it a decent start, which I'm guessing you probably would, then um, you will usually get the low partial credit. What revision book would be most useful? It's entirely up to you. Right. Obviously, I'm biased because I write them, but it's entirely up to you. I would say go to a bookshop, look at the ones that are on the market. There's only two or three. Flick through them. You're going to you're going to look at one and go, yeah, okay, I like that one and pick the one that you like the look of. What should be a realistic time to finish up the course? It'll be down to your teacher, really, right? But there's only so fast that you can do this course that if your teacher starts to go too fast, a lot of you will become lost, right? And I know that myself. If I start to go, OK, I want to get this done before midterm and I start to speed up the pace, it doesn't work, right? My students are going, hang on, I didn't get that. And they're making me slow down. They're making me go back and they're making me do things. There's only really so, so fast that you can get this course done. I would think most likely after Easter, right? April, it's a two year course, right? Some of all your courses are two year courses, but some are longer than others. So about April, but as what well, would be good as if you were doing revision as time goes on, 
right? So your teachers might, I know we do that in school. So we give them little revision tests. So like they did trigonometry in fifth year. So they might have a trigonometry test in November of sixth year, just to keep revision going in the background. But in terms of actually finishing up the course, it'll be it'll be late enough in the year. So if you're thinking oh, we're not finished yet, don't panic, right? Because most schools won't be finished yet. What kind of grade can you get from just getting low partial credit, high partial credit, but not actually getting the final answer? It depends. Depends. Like you see there, some of the questions, the marks were 0, 3, 7, 10. So if you did low partial credit, that's 3 out of 10. That's 30 percent. If you picked up some high partial credits, they might be 7 out of 10. So on balance, hopefully it would be enough to get a pass. Right. But you don't you can't take that to the bank. Some of them are not that high. Is it smarter to focus on topics you're better at or worse at? Um, we are going to enjoy focusing on the topics you're better at, aren't you? Which might make it make more sense to focus on the ones you're worse at and then try to improve on those is what I would say. What is important is paper one. Algebra is vital. You need to know all the ins and outs of algebra and differential calculus in particular for paper one. All right. Paper two, your trigonometry is massively important and probability comes up a huge amount as well, right? So I would focus on those. Your coordinate geometry is there as well, of course, right? I mean, that every topic is all over the place, but make sure that you do those. Now, I'm just going to flick into the chat here to see, did I, did I miss anything in the chat? Um, now, I think this goes the other way, does it? Let me see. How to do some research. Does the marking scheme allow for multiple methods of completing a question? Absolutely, Laura, it does. Yeah, right. So it'll often have um, method one, method two present in the marking scheme. Or what it'll sometimes do is the people who are at the who are correcting will be told they won't write it in the marking scheme, but they'll be told if another method was used then to do that. If you square the root, can't square it. Would you be able to send on the PowerPoint, please? Yeah, the guys are going to do that tomorrow. They're going to email you the PowerPoint. What formula do I use to find an X value? I'm not I'm not sure what that means, Michaela. Um, what formula you use to find an X value? If it's in um, your statistics, it's probably your Z score value, but that's that's a very specific question that you're asking me there. OK, let me just jump back here. Are there any more questions? OK, right, we're going to start wrapping it up, guys, now. So if you have any more questions, throw them in and we're going to finish this up now in a few minutes. Right, I want to get you out within the hour. If you attempt a question two different ways with two different answers, we'll get full marks if one of the methods is right. Brilliant question, Laura. Thank you. I should have said this. Absolutely. Right. Provided you don't cross one of them out. OK, so you're not supposed to cross out any work. That's the first thing. So if you do a question, and then later on, you're looking back and you go, oh, gosh, I'm not sure I did that right. Just put a, a line down and say attempt two, or go to the back and say attempt two and write on it. I have attempted this again on the back pages or whatever. Don't cross it out because if you were right the first time you've crossed it out, they can't give you the marks, right? Because you're telling them, no, I don't don't ignore that one. This is my new answer and you could be wrong. You could have been right the first time and you just doubted yourself. So don't cross anything out. Just write attempt to. They have to correct every attempt that you put down and give you the best marks. OK. Same for if you answer more than your required questions, right? Do you have to um, they have to correct everything and then they'll give you the best marks. Is 30 percent a pass, Maria? No, it's not considered a pass. 30 percent is a H7. You won't get your bonus points with a H7. You have to have at least a H6 to get the bonus points. But some colleges, to the best of my knowledge, will accept a H7 to allow you in. But you would need to check your course requirements. OK, but uh, you won't get your bonus points if you're uh, if you're in a H7 bracket. If I put brackets around it, would it count as crossing out? Um, no, it wouldn't. But just don't do it. Just don't do it. Put a line under it and say attempt to. Right, just and write attempt two and let them know. Attempt one, attempt two, attempt three, maybe attempt four, maybe. The only place that won't work is if it's like a multiple choice question and you tick all the boxes, you won't get any marks, right? They're wise to you. You can't say, oh yeah, I think it's A and B and C, right? You'll get zero marks if you tick more than one of the boxes for a multiple choice question, right? But don't put brackets, don't cross out, don't, whatever you do, don't, don't even bring tipex into the exam. Don't bring tipex into the exam, OK? Don't tipex anything out. Just put a line under it 
and try again. They have to correct everything. Uh, can you be marked on multiple answers given if all attempts are marked? Can you be marked on mul multiple answers given if all attempts? Yes. Yeah, but they what they'll do is they'll mark each solution independently. So say for your attempt one, you get three out of ten. Then your attempt two, you get seven out of ten. Then you get seven out of ten. OK, is that clear? Right, so they ignore the, the one that you got the three out of ten. They don't add them and go, actually, we'll give them ten out of ten. Um, would having bad handwriting make it easier to lose marks? If they can't make out the answer, then yeah, you're going to lose marks, right? Poor layout will go against you as well. Try to have your layout clear. Try to start at the top left and work your way down. Don't be scribbling all over. Don't have a bit here and a bit here, a bit here, a bit here. I've had students before and say the answer was X equals to two and they didn't get the marks. And when we looked at the paper, they had written up here in the corner X equals to two. The person correctly couldn't see it. They didn't find it. Right. So you need to be very clear. Highlight your answers. Put a box around them. Put a line under them. Make it super clear for whoever's correcting your exam that when they look at it, they go, oh, X equals two. Perfect. Ten marks on. We go to the next thing. Right. Just think about if you were correcting your exam. Would it be easy to correct? Right. You have to think of it from their point of view. And they're not just sitting down going, no, let me see. I'm going to correct Louise's exam here and now and I'm going to give it all my time and attention. They are going to, um, they've got like 400 exam papers to correct. So they're just, OK, that's right. Full marks on to the next question, on to the next question, on to the next question. They're not going to spend huge time and energy looking through a mess. All right. So think of it from the examiner's point of view. How come I squared is minus one? Because I is the square root of minus one, Michaela. You need to go back there and look at the start of your complex numbers chapter, right? Look at the introduction where they explain what imaginary numbers are and go from there or ask your teacher. Ask your teacher. OK, any other questions? These are great questions, guys. Will you still get marks if you attempt a question, but do not finish the question? Absolutely. Yeah, if you attempt it and you get halfway through it, depends on where their marking scheme stops. You see when you look at the marking scheme, so low partial credit for doing this much, then you get mid partial credit for doing the next bit. And then if you stop, you'll get those marks, right? So you'll get marks for, for the correct work that you did. Absolutely. Okay, I'll just click back to there. OK, all right, guys, I think I think you've run out of questions, have you? Fantastic. Right. Well, listen, thank you for joining me tonight. That was great. And I'm glad that you engage with me so much. That's fantastic. And all those questions are wonderful. Right. So this has been recorded. So as soon as I, I click leave now, it will stop the recording and they'll send it. The, the, our marketing guys will send it out to you tomorrow. They'll send you a link. I'm not sure how it works. Right. The guys do all of that. So have a lovely evening. Right. I'll let you let a lot of you go before I click it out and have a lovely evening. And thank you so much for joining me and asking all those great questions that other people I'm sure were thinking of as well. All right, bye bye guys. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. You're Thanks, welcome. Best of luck with it all now, guys. Thank you. 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 Now I'm going to finish this now, guys. Okay, bye-bye. Have a lovely evening.